do it. All right. And welcome everyone to yet another Prevail Compliance Corner. I am Orly Burlov, and you I'm are Paul Vestal. Yeah, I just keep on hoping those names will change sometime. Like, no, yeah, never mind. <laughs> We're both wearing black today. Are we going to the same funeral? Well, maybe it's like Johnny Cash. You know, it's like always in black. Yeah, we're just we're the people in black. We're the ladies in black today. I think we should have our own superheroes like movie or something. I like it. Ladies in black. <laughs> I, I think I think it could sell. Saving compliance everywhere. So, next time I'm going to get dressed up in a cape and like okay. be super compliance. Done. I'm yeah. here for it. Okay. <laughs> Um, all right. So why don't we get uh, started with this week's Compliance Corner, talk and tell everyone what we are going to talk about. Security protection assets. Yep. Yep. So this is actually something I talked about with Ryan Bonner several months mm -hmm. back, right when uh, this whole idea of scoping and the scoping guide had just come out. And it seemed like at the end of December 2021, there was a release of the scoping guide and people started worrying about this. But you were telling me just like in the past few months, right, this has kind of gone from the people that, uh, kind of just uh, talking about it, the chattering classes, mentioning it to really being a full blown, I don't know, a full blown issue amongst uh, people who are looking to become CMC compliant. Um, so, you know, with that as kind of a little bit of background, why don't we just jump in and start off by saying what are security protection assets and why are they important? Yeah, definitely. And I think, and just to kind of, you know, throw a little bit more color into what you said, I, I was as guilty of this as anybody, you know, when the, the 2.0 stuff came out and, you know, it's like, oh, I got to get my hands on the assessor's guide and look at that. And that was like the most important thing. And I think that that might be why a little bit, it kind of took a little while longer for people to pay more attention to that. So right. So I was just as guilty of it. You know, everybody got really crazy about, you know, doing the 2.0 and, oh, it's 110 controls, it's not 130. What are they? How has it changed? What's different? And the scoping guide, I'm sure there are people out there who absolutely jumped on the scoping guide immediately, but I think a lot of people- Ryan did. Right, of course he did. Ryan is amazing. So of course he did. Um, I am not as amazing as Ryan Bonner at all. So I definitely was, you know, in the thick of it at that point too, you know, much like our, a lot of our customers are, do, you know, actually implementing these controls. And I was sort of overwhelmed by it, as a lot of our customers are, definitely. So I'm just as guilty of this. And then the scoping guy, you know, it took a few months to be like, oh, wait, oh, the scoping guy. Yeah, that's a thing now. I should probably look at that. And I think that's kind of what's happened, unfortunately, with a lot of people in the defense industrial base is that they've had a minute to digest the 2.0 right. family and they've kind of gone, okay, I think I have a handle on this. Oh, what is this piece of paper over here? What are these eight pages of things talking about scoping guide? Um, again, I don't think that's everybody, but I think it, there's a lot of us out there who have who have been sort of in that place. So I think that's probably at least contributing in some way to why it's it's coming out in the past couple of months more than it was back in like so it's moment in the sun. It's five minutes it's of fame. Getting it's, it's many minutes of fame. Oh yeah. yeah. So why don't you tell people what a security protection asset is and what does it mean? Certainly. Certainly. So a security protection asset um is something that is either a person or a technology or a facility related to processing CUI. So I know that's kind of like a weird thing to say, but it's, you know, how does you, know, there are people that maybe are outside of your organization that could process CUI. There are technologies that you could be using that are inside or outside of your, of your, of your actual um, organization that are processing CUI. And there could be a facility that has CUI in it physically or digitally. So that's what a security protection asset is, is holding any sort of asset technology people facility that is holding on to controlling, processing, transmitting sensitive data for the government. And it's important for that kind of the definition uh, answers the question why that's important. So if you're trying to live up to the letter of the NIST 800-171 um, requirements and CMMC, uh, you need to be careful as to who's handling CUI, where it is in your system and how it's managed. And so this whole idea of scoping uh, makes you try and think of, okay, really knowing where your CUI is handled within, uh, within your facility. So that is what it is and why it's important. But, you know, for someone who's listening to this, um, to this video, Noel, how do they know whether an SBA uh, applies to them or, or not? If this, well, how do you know if this is something you need to worry about? It's a good question. 
I think almost every person who is going after CMMC level one or two, especially level two, and, and most definitely I would assume level three as well, even though there's no level three scoping guide, but because we don't have that physical you know, information at this point, but really a, a security protection asset, I mean, like we said, is, is people, technology, and facilities processing CUI. So if you are especially at the level two or level three, this applies to you. <laughs> it applies to you. It's going to apply to you because the assessors who come in to right. do their assessment are going to look at these 110 controls and say, okay, well, how are you addressing different points of these controls? Well, a lot of those controls that are out there are going to need, you know, additional people. They're going to need additional, you know, technologies and they may need additional facilities if you're going to be, you know, pushing things out to a third party provider of some kind. Yeah. So can I make the uh, next step and, and say that it's almost implicit in, in you being uh, an organization looking to achieve CMMC level two compliance that SBA is going to apply to you in some shape or form? Yeah, I think that's that's fair. I can't think of a situation where it wouldn't be. I mean, maybe there's somewhere and out there that doesn't have any security protection assets somehow, but I, I don't see how that would be possible. So yeah. Yeah, it's pretty much everybody. I'm um, um, level one might be able to get away without it. Level two and three there. I don't think there's any way to get around. Yeah. It. That'll be a little bit of mental gymnastics. I mean, so we've established that SPAs or this kind of uh, scoping is something everyone needs to be involved in and worry about. Yeah. Um, who's a, who's looking to achieve level two. Now, how do you as a organization, uh, a defense organization seeking level two, how do you figure out whether something is within the scope of um, being an SPA or not? I, you know, I'm, I'm paraphrasing that guy named Hamlet. Uh, CMMC and Hamlet are always, you know, no, I mean, just I, that's always what I think. I think peanut butter and jelly Shakespeare compliance. It's always they're always together. Forever. Yes. Yes, You're definitely. Yeah, definitely. So. No, of course. To be or not to be, that is the question. So is it an SBA or is it not an SBA? Right. So if you look in the scoping guide, it actually breaks it down again by people, technologies and facilities. So right. but Let's which is a moment and um, highlight those. So people, people, technology, technology, and facility. facility. Okay. So it's so the three main things. People, place and things. <laughs> basically. Right. Place and things to be more, place and things. more, more to the point. So easier. I mean, Let's just uh, draw it out a little bit more clearly with an example. Uh, you and sure. I had talked about uh, an example of like an MSP, for example. Perfect example. So if we're looking at the people part of this, right? So let's say that you have an MSP for anybody who doesn't know as a managed service provider. So they can provide any kind of service, IT related, usually specifically. Um, these are people who can, you know, manage, like if you have a Windows 365 environment, you might have a managed service provider who manages that Windows 365 for your right. company. Um, you know, you could also have like a vulnerability scanning that is managed through a managed service provider. There's a lot of different things that you can get through a managed service provider. Depends on the managed service provider and what you're looking for. Okay, that being said, so let's go back to our example of taking a managed service provider, an MSP, and let's look at SPAs, which are security protection assets in the people section. So right. where are their SPAs for the people section of an MSP. I know that's like so many different acronyms in the same sense. <laughs> so how many, how would people be applied here? If you have a managed service provider that you're using, let's say that they do all of your IT support desk stuff. So let's, it, let's say that, you know, Orly, you call up the managed service provider and you say, Hey, my computer is not working. I really need some help. I don't know what to do. You walk through a whole bunch of steps. They're like, you know what? I'm going to have to remote into your machine. Right. And if you go, no problem. And you allow them to remote into your machine. If that machine that you're working on has CUI on it. Right. That they're means they're in scope. They're in scope. Correct. That 100% means that now suddenly that MSP and that person specifically. So like whoever is on their IT team, who's going to be, you know, looking at your computer and fixing it is now in scope. That means that you have to have policy and procedure about that. Right. You have to have information about that MSP. What are their security protocols? What kind of, how secure is that, that connection they have remotely with you? You know, are they a U.S. person? Are they not a U.S. person? There, there's so many things that come into scope at that point. So that is one thing. One of the easy ways to, uh, again, this is why scoping is important. So you think about that and you go, oh my gosh, how am I going to do this? Well, you could just put a policy in place and say, no one is allowed to have the MSP remote into my machine. 
And that right. means that that is not a security protection asset now. You've, you've cut that off. You've said, no, no, we're not doing that. And so then when you're on the phone, Orly, and you say, and they say, hey, can I remote in? You go, nope, we can't do that. You're going to just have to figure out how to walk me through it from here. And there you go. So that's how to not make it a security protection asset. So now let's move on to the technology part, which is a big part of MSP. Right. Huge. So if you have a technology that is in scope, if you have some kind of like vulnerability scanning management, you know, or you've got, I don't know, if you've got an enterprise wide antivirus software, okay. let's say as an example, right? Well, something like a bit defender, even. Yeah, like there's all kinds of different things it could be. But let's just say like it's some sort of enterprise wide deployed managed okay. by your service provider, right? They deploy it for you, they manage it for you, they're doing everything. That is on all of your machines. Well, let's say that one of those machines has CUI on it. That means that that's, that that virus scanning is scanning a machine that has CUI on it. It is right. scanning files that have CUI on it. That means it's a security protection asset and that you're going to have to make sure to include it in scope and say, okay, this is the managed service provider who, you, who does this. This is the amount of influence they have and don't have. This is where you, you're going to have to track all of that and track that actual individual technology very clearly in all of your policies and procedures saying, you know, this, this is who manages it. You know, we don't manage it. We have this company that does. Here's all their credentials about how they're super great and fabulous and super safe and wonderful. And that's why we use them. Now, again, if you decided not to do that, let's say that you decided to instead, you know, deploy something on individual machines yourself that you control, then it's it's still a security protection asset, but you're not going to have to include all the stuff about that MSP. So that's a kind of interesting sort of gray area there. Then you've got facility. Right. So I was going to ask, when does that come in? Facility. So let's say for the sake of argument that you have physical CUI for some reason, for whatever reason you have physical CUI. You you are going to have that CUI digitized and stored on a specific server, but you are not going to be able to digitize it. You're going to have this MSP digitize it for you. Okay, they're going to keep it on their server. They're going to do all the process. That okay. server, yes, they're going to put it on the cloud for you. This is going to be great. You trust this MSP. It's going to be wonderful. You're not going to have any physical CUI anymore. Hooray! When they digitize it and hold it on that server they again become a security protection asset that MSP does because of where they're storing that information for you. Their right. facility, where that server lives, their facility where they're processing your paper CUI, that actual like location, office, data center, whatever it is, that all becomes in scope because they physically have your CUI in that location. Right. So going to that example of the server, right? If they were managing a server, it would have to be FedRAMP moderate. It would have to have DFARC through G incident reporting. Yep. Right. It has to be FIPS 140-2 compliant for encryption. There's a there's right. a bunch of different things that it has to have. So there are a lot of advantages to going this route with it, like an MSP or a CSP or, or you know, basically outsourcing it to someone else. Because as long as you pick somebody who's really dependable and has all of the sort of credentials that you need to be able to check right. all the right boxes... They can be a, an amazing way to take a whole lot of work off of your plate and to put take it off of your scope and put it yep. in someone else's scope. Put it exactly because then you end up inheriting. Like for example, let's say that you have an MSP that's really fantastic and great, and you know they've gone through all the rigor, they've done all the things they're supposed to do correctly. In the people side, you could say, "Oh yeah, we do have people who remote in. Here's all of their information from that MSP. Here's their FedRAMP moderate. Here's their FIPS 140. Right. You know, here's all the information that they will give you." right? The MSP gives you that and you just go, here you go. Here's all the information. Oh, okay. Their technology that we use. Yeah. Yeah. That's fine. Here's all the information about that and how it's compliant in every conceivable way. And a lot of MSPs and CSPs will give you like information. Like, like we have a customer responsibility matrix and a lots of documentation about that. Right. Most, any, any good company that's going to be doing CSP MSP type work is going to have something like that. Same thing with facility. You then inherit all the facility stuff. So facility, maintenance, you know, that kind of stuff. You can inherit a lot of that from an MSP. And again, even though it seems like it makes your scope bigger, it can actually make your scope a lot smaller because then you're not dealing with that stuff directly. You're paying somebody to kind of do it for you. Right. But again, you know, buyer beware. <laughs> make sure. Tour. Make sure that you are looking into this MSP, this CSP. Make sure they understand CMMC, that they take it seriously. That they you know that you can get those credentials so that when your auditors ask and they will, you have that information ready to go. Yeah. So I think the last question to kind of ask here, and uh, it uh, 
kind of brings a nice little bookend to this discussion. I like, I like the bookend. It's creating barriers. You know, yeah. we really talk about creating barriers as a bad thing, but here it's actually um, a logical extension of what we were just talking about and mm -hmm. allows you to think about this idea of um, creating like um, scopes and rooms where information exists and where it doesn't. So, you know, you have logical barriers and you have physical barriers um, in which to um, control information. Right. How, first of all, why don't you describe the difference between uh, f physical and logical barriers and how you can use them um, for security protection assets? Yeah, definitely. So you've got, like you said, you've got the, it was perfectly put. You've got logical and physical um, assets, or excuse me, not assets, barriers. barriers. You know, it's like, you know, like they say that it's great to set up boundaries in relationships. It is great to set up boundaries when you're talking about security. It's going to make things a lot easier for you. <laughs> it's going to scope it all down. So. All right. Honey, <laughs> no, thank you. Space. <laughs> I need you to walk away right now. Sorry. So, like a lot, a logical separation would be, for example, if I'm on a computer that has no CUI on it, the computer itself doesn't, and then I have to log into like a VPN or a VPI or what you know, a VDI or what have you, some sort of virtual, a, basically a desktop somewhere else, a right. computer somewhere else that does have CUI. On it. We did do a video on virtual desktop uh, infrastructure a couple of videos back. So we sure did. If you want to know more about those. All right, but go exactly. ahead. So let's say, let's take the example of VDI since we did do, uh, we did do a show about that a few weeks ago. So if you're talking about like, again, you're on a computer that doesn't have CUI and you log into a VDI and you do have CUI on that VDI, that is a logical separation between me with my computer and then I'm logging into another computer. Now it looks like I'm seeing it on my machine, right? Right, but, but it's I'm not. a virtual computer. Exactly. That is logging into completely separate things. So that's a logical separation. Now, a physical separation would be like, let's take the example of, you know, that company that had a whole bunch of paper CUI. Let's say they took all that paper CUI and they decided not to digitize it, but instead they're going to put it in a locked room. Right. And you're going to have a little sign in, sign out sheet on the outside of it. And there's only two people who have keys and they have to let you in and they have to watch you the whole time as you look at your piece of paper that's CUI and you're not allowed to take pictures of it or copy it or anything. And you put and it right back. The CUI out of the room. It's you can't take it out of the room and it, it's in a locked little cabinet and then the door is locked and like there's a big red light outside and all kinds of stuff. That would be a physical separation of CUI. That means that CUI is very, very physically separated at that point. So yeah, those would be the two differences. You've got two differences. You've got logical where it's like we talked about with the VPN or v, excuse me, the VDI. And then you've got the physical, which more physical separation usually, usually refers to more physical CDI, C, CUI, but it can also like refer to a different server too. So like if you had, you know, two different servers, That'd be physically, physical and logical. physically and logically separated, right? Where you could only access one server from one type of computer that had CUI and then everybody else could, you know, access this other server that didn't. That would be physical and logical. So you, they definitely cross over in a lot of ways too. I get your logic. Thanks. Um, wow. Well, so that's a great ex uh, explanation. Thanks. Um, so, you know, people out there who are listening to this, um, we know you probably have a lot of questions about this whole idea of security protection assets. It's, as we said at the beginning of this video, it's just recently become a much more talked about um, issue. So we know that you're probably still have a lot of things that are occurring to you. So if you have questions, reach out to Noel, compliance at prevail.com. That's uh, the Noel's email address, and you can always read her there. Um, and if there's any questions you might have about how Prevail takes care of this, if you're a customer, also reach out to us. Um, so I think that we've kind of uh, said all there is to say about this. Thank you guys for tuning in and we will see you next time. Bye. Bye. Bye.